everybody in here. So I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who's been able to support us on the GoFundMe to help us uh, build up a fund to rebuild our workshop and everybody support us on Patreon. It's been a really surprisingly huge outpouring of support and uh, a lot of positive messages that have been very encouraging. As a YouTube creator, it's pretty easy to get kind of focused on just the negative comments and uh, abstract numbers and an algorithm and kind of lose sight of just the community behind uh, everything. Uh, it's been a really great reminder. Very thankful for everyone for that. And uh, we are definitely going to be rebuilding as soon as the dust settles and insurance is all settled and uh, can produce some even greater content. So thanks again to everybody. Until then, we had a, a few different videos that were in the works. Uh, now I can't quite really finish as we intended. Um, for this video, we were hoping to kind of revisit the uh, composite bow I made and try to make some improvements to it, as well as exploring some different historical uh, kind of unique types of arrows, including ones that would be dipped in poison. However, the, the bow and uh, a lot of the stuff for making the arrows has all burned up in the garage, so that part of the video can't really be done anymore. But we did get a really interesting visit to a poison specialist uh, I wanted to release, so enjoy that. For this channel, I end up exploring a lot of unique areas, and often on the top of my mind is the presence of things like poisonous snakes, whether in the cotton fields of Texas, abandoned mines in Utah, or ones in California, or the jungles of Mexico. I'm always paranoid of running into something venomous while in a remote part of the world, hours away from any hospital. Definitely not safe to do this. But this always made me wonder what exactly is the science behind treating such venomous bites. Well, to gain a little more insight, I paid a visit to one of the few places in the U.S. that produces anti-venom, M-Toxin in Wisconsin. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering awesome curated boxes of high quality goods from some pretty sweet brands. It's free to join and shows up right at your door. You like tacos? You like knives? You like socks? You like coffee? Bespoke Post has you covered. Boxes are screened based on the preference quiz you fill out. The box lineup changes each month, so you can always discover something new and unique. Before it's shipped, you get a preview of what comes inside, decide if you like to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. You can also cancel your subscription at any time. The Bare Bones Trowel Knife has probably been with me the longest and I've been using it for a lot of planting as well as basic around the house type tasks. Overall, it's a very useful tool, trusty in all situations. The blanket is pretty impressive, coupled with the whiskey making kit, really warms you up on a cold night. The camera guy actually used the charcoal soap and incense but has a 5 star positive review. To get 20% off your first box, go to the link in the description and enter HTME at checkout. Sign up for Bespoke Post today, you won't be disappointed. Thanks to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video. From Scorpion Stings, to the skin of frogs, to the bites of snakes and spiders, and even the capsaicin that makes peppers spicy. <coughs> <coughs> Toxins, venoms, and poisons can be found in a wide variety of animals and plants as a natural defense mechanism. The earliest use of poisons by humans were for hunting. The grooves carved into arrowheads and spears which held plant-based poisons that could bring down an animal in seconds have been found around the world. Occasionally poisons would be gathered from animals like the poison dart frog from South America, or the larva of beetles found in parts of Africa, the Bushman arrow poison beetle. Some of the oldest records of toxins being used as a murder weapon date back to around 3500 BCE. Some of the earliest cures for poisoning were pretty strange, like amulets that are supposed to absorb poison made from unicorn horn or bezoar, or cups that were said to be able to detect poison if you drank from them. King Mithridates in the 1st century BCE spent years researching cures for poisons and testing them on criminals who were going to be executed. Eventually he discovered a mixture of ingredients that supposedly worked as an antidote for most poisons called Mithridatium. He would also regularly take small amounts of different toxins in an attempt to make himself immune. This worked a little too well for him, however, when Rome invaded and he was unable to poison himself due to his tolerance. His research and antidote recipe were brought to Rome and was used well into the Renaissance era. The modern science of anti-venom started in 1901 when Brazilian scientist Vital Brazil was working to prove that venomous bites could be treated with the antibodies found in animal venoms. He was able to use these antibodies to create the first serum which worked against several of the most common snake venoms in Brazil. Over the next few decades, he was able to lower the death rates from snake bites from 25% to 2%. Vital Brazil was also the first to create venom antibodies for scorpions and spider venoms, and his method of using antibodies for immunized animals is still the most effective way of creating anti-venom to this day. All right, so I'm here with Nathaniel at M-Toxin. Tell me a little bit about your business. M-Toxins is a venom extraction facility that opened in 2011, and we collected venom for a number of different scientific research papers uh, on venom evolution, snake physiology, and anti-venom. In 2019, we expanded and we turned half the facility into 
a educational center and use the rest of the space to expand our production. We're one of nine venom labs in the world that supplies for anti-venoms, and we're one of only two labs that supplies laboratory-grade scorpion venom. How many different types of animals do you have here? There's over 1,100 animals on site, 12 to 15 species of cobras, every species of mamba, if I was to go through every species of everything we have, it would be probably about 150 unique species of animal, and that's snakes, scorpions, and spiders, and centipedes. So are they all raised here? We raise some of the animals here, but primarily our animals are imported. The reason for that is there's certain types of animals whose venom changes geographically. So it's very important that if we're making a snake bite antivenom for, let's say, Kenya, and the venom is different of a certain type of snake in Kenya that we incorporate it. For the animals that don't have those types of variations, we work with zoos. Otherwise, we work with Reptile Preservation Institute to breed our animals. So how does the venom extraction work? In the safest way possible, we restrain the snake. Uh, we get it into our bare hands. That way we have the dexterity and tactile feeling that we need uh, to be gentle with the animal. We bring the animal to a sterile vessel and we have the animal bite naturally into that vessel. And that gets us our raw venom. So what's the process of making the actual anti-venom? The anti-venom is made by a very simple vaccination process, taking sublethal doses of the venom to an animal, a host animal. Typically it's horses, sheep can be used. See if you inject it, the venom into a, a live animal? That's correct. The animal is microdosed with a very small amount of venom. They don't feel it at all. It's just enough to get an immune response out of them. So they start making what are called IgG antibodies against that venom. It doesn't harm the animal whatsoever. They don't realize that it's happening. When the animal is building its immunity, on a regular schedule, they give a blood draw. The plasma is separated. Then from there, it goes through a purification and freezing process uh, where it's freeze-dried and it becomes a powder, and that actually becomes anti-venom. And from there, it's weighed out and shipped all over the world. So why does it have to be horses and sheep? Do they have like a natural immunity? Horses are one of the best because of the amount of plasma you get during a blood draw. So you're able to get and yield so much more. With sheep, it was found that there were less people allergic to sheep than to horses. There's less uh, chance of allergic reaction. It's completely done in an ethical manner and it's heavily regulated. Because naturally if those horses aren't healthy or the sheep, if they're not healthy, it's gonna produce a bad drug. No one can afford that when it's life-saving anti-venom. So here's venom that's been freeze-dried. This is actual black mamba venom. It's just a nice white powder. Hmm. And this is how it'll go to the pharmaceutical company. And then here is an actual vial of anti-venom that we supply for. And all that's in here is saline and the purified horse plasma. So right there is your anti-venom. The only thing, as I said, between this part of the process and this, is the host animal. What's the most poisonous animal you have here? Uh, the most poisonous animal we have here is the inland taipan. They're an Australian snake. They say that with one bite from that snake, it can take 100 lives of adults. However, they live such a secluded life and are such a placid animal, there's hardly ever envenomations. Basically, they don't kill people. Of all the animals you have here, like what's What's your favorite when you have to work with it and what's like your least favorite you hate having to work with? So my least favorite yeah. are large Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes yeah. um, because they're just big, powerful animals that stand their ground. No snake is aggressive, no snake will chase you. There's only different levels of defensiveness and my favorite are the mamba family. Do you ever get bit? I have been bitten three times over the course of my career. Three times out of well over 100,000 venom extractions. Oh, wow. One was a, a terrible bite um, from a stiletto snake, and there was no anti-venom for that snake at that time, so it was only pain management. Then there was a fertilance and a black mamba envenomation. So if you get bit anywhere, is this probably the best place to get bit? It is the best place to get bit because the anti-venom is a few feet away. Yeah. The hospital is less than 10 minutes away. The black mamba bite, for example, I had anti-venom within 35 minutes after being symptomatic. I was home with my family that evening. So you yeah. kept saying you wanted to see vipers. So yeah. let me make up some new vessels. We'll get you inside here do some snakes. A couple of rules, don't lean against anything, watch where your hands are at all times. 
So this is where we actually do our extraction. Whatever you do, don't go by that tub that's open. Hi, little pookie bear. So this is a cotton mouth, also known as a water moccasin. They're called cotton mouths because as part of their defense, they'll shake their tail like you see, and they'll also open their mouth, which is white inside. So we gently pin down on the snake, reach in and grab it. We're going to a sterile collection vessel, and we let them bite. And that's the process. Wow. So she has a nice, clean home to go back to, and now she'll be left alone for outside of being fed for several weeks. We typically do several of the same species. All right, so those are some cotton mouths. So you got your vipers, but let's do a couple cobra. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? Come on, honey. So same process of capturing a cobra. And there, she sprayed a good amount of venom in there. Oh. And that's the process. You can hear them all enjoying themselves in there. <laughs> So they have to choose to release the venom when they bite then? Absolutely, we don't, we don't express a snake's venom glands, which can be done by applying slight pressure to the outside of where the muscle is that controls the glands. We prefer to have them bite naturally and um, we have good luck with doing it that way. There are times that certain specimens just don't want to do it and we don't force it. We don't feel it's ethical to, to do that. So we'll give them another two week break and then come back and try the next time. Turning them will slightly disorient them. This guy does not want to play ball. Calm yourself down. And now it's mandatory as part of my protocol. I'll do six snakes and then take a break. We can do a couple scorpions quick. Come on. And it's almost impossible to see, but there's about three little drops right over here. Oh. And we'd simply just continue to repeat the process. The centipedes we work with kill people. Oh. So you could probably get a shot of the over the top of this centipede. So that one will kill you? Oh, yes. Where's that one from? Uh, from uh, Asia. To get poisoned, does it like just, just a nick with it enough? Well, it depends. Bites can happen in so many different ways. You have the size of the animal, mm -hmm. the type of the animal, its disposition, because in a lot of cases, uh, people get what are called dry bites. They're bitten by a venomous snake, but the snake chose to not release any venom. Um, so then you're just treating puncture wounds. The other thing that's difficult is the human body, because you and I could be bit by the same snake, given the same exact amount of venom out of that snake, and uh, you may have an underlying kidney issue, I may have an underlying liver issue, and that venom could expose us to that, and that becomes the secondary part of treating a snake bite. The thing is, is we don't have a way to test how toxic a poison is unless we use what's called the lethal dose 50. In the lethal dose 50, they take, let's say, 100 mice, and they dose specific amounts of venom, and the amount that it takes to kill 50% of the population is your lethal dose 50. That's what we go by. So many of these animals that are in here have a different lethal dose 50. What's the difference between a poison and a toxin? They're essentially the same thing. A lot of people say, and, and uh, very passionately, that a poison must be ingested, a venom must be injected, and that is true, but uh, poisons are venoms and venoms are poison. It's all a toxin, yeah. it's, it's all the same thing. If you were to take uh, the poison from a toad and inject it, it's going to have <laughs> a very negative effect on the body. We don't really differentiate. And in most languages uh, outside English, poison is the term that's used. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.